Well, so grateful for uh, the help of Arena Theater with our scripture reading. Uh, if you don't know the words of the uh, Montgomery Variations, I want Jesus to walk with me, great spiritual, uh, good words to know and to sing. Well, again, this morning we are uh, talking as we were on Monday about the presence of Jesus and his power to heal. And I wonder if anything is more desperate than the prayer of a parent who is asking God to heal a beloved child. So family on our campus that knows what this is like, a couple, African couple from our graduate school who prayed for the healing of their beautiful daughter, Ella. Ella was born with a heart defect. Her oxygen rate was only 70%. They took her to doctors in their home country. They frankly doubted whether she would live past the age of five. They took her to a large hospital in a neighboring country where they learned about possible heart surgery, but only if they could go overseas to get it. And when their travel visa was denied, they were heartbroken, praying in faith, yet wondering how their daughter would ever be healed. I think the man in Mark chapter nine could relate. A desperate man who stood out from the crowd one day to ask if there was anything that Jesus could do to heal his son. And frankly, the man had his doubts. That's what our series is about this year, specifically this morning, doubting God's power to heal. And he told Jesus that he had brought his son to him. The boy had a spirit that would seize him and cast him down. And he had asked the disciples to cast it out, but they were not able. By this point in the Gospel of Mark, and we learned this on Monday, the disciples had been given authority to cast out demons. They had performed, the scripture says, many miraculous healings. But in this case, they were unable to do anything. This was a difficult case of demonic possession. They, term unclean spirit is mentioned throughout the passage and the noisy crowd could see this for themselves. This boy needed an exorcism and when he was brought closer to the presence of Jesus, he was convulsed with a violent seizure. He fell on the ground. He rolled around. He was foaming at the mouth. To better diagnose these dangerous symptoms, Jesus inquired about the boy's case history. He learned that the situation was lifelong, that the boy's condition was, was nearly fatal. And it's, it's true, if Satan could, he would destroy us, body and soul. And this is one of the reasons why we all need healing, physical, spiritual, psychological healing. This fallen world is harmful. And sooner or later, we all need Renewal for our weary souls. Do you feel that this morning? Comfort for a grieving heart. Healing for a broken body. We are truly harmed by what others have done personally and communally. And behind all of it, there is this homicidal enemy who has been hurting humanity since the Garden of Eden. And anyone who has ever felt sick or wounded or oppressed can relate to this poor family and how powerless they felt. And the failure of the disciples only added to their sense of desperation. These poor disciples are in way over their heads. And we can relate to that as well, I think, because it's not just our own need for healing that makes us feel powerless and sometimes doubtful about what God will do. We are burdened sometimes overwhelmed by the needs of people we are trying to help, including perhaps people who doubt. Have you ever watched someone you love struggle with an unending illness? Or tried to comfort someone who was inconsolable? Have you ever prayed for someone to get better and then watched them get worse? How will we, how will our loved ones ever be healed? Sometimes, as, as was the case in Mark chapter 9, it seems like the healing we need will take a miracle. 
I like the way that our own Keith Johnson summarized this passage. He said, this father needed a miracle. His son had a spiritual affliction that often left him on the ground, seized up, foaming at the mouth. The terror could strike at any moment. Once his son had been standing next to the fire and he fell into it, causing terrible scars. Another time he was cast into the water and nearly drowned. This father must have worried about his son constantly. No doctor had been able to help, but maybe Jesus could do something. Well, maybe he could. And yet, when Jesus arrives on the scene, at first he too seems frustrated. It's one of those poignant moments when our Savior <clears throat> feels weighed down by the troubles of fallen humanity. How long am I going to have to put up with this faithful generation, he says. How, how long am I going to have to bear with you? But not waiting to answer his own rhetorical questions, Jesus issues this thrilling invitation. Bring him to me. Bring him to me. It's a simple welcome that marks a turning point in the boy's life and I believe gives genuine hope to anyone who needs healing. Whenever the people we care about need help, and if you know somebody who needs help this morning, you should be thinking about that person, praying for that person, even as we study the scriptures. We are invited to bring those people to Jesus, and we can do the same thing with our own problems, whatever they are. Bring them to me, Jesus says. Bring me your anxiety about the future. Bring me your broken relationship. Bring me your chronic illness or the abuse that you have suffered. Bring me your disappointment in life. Bring me your, your life-dominating addiction. Bring me any trouble that you have, whether it is big or small. The Savior is inviting us to bring our troubles to him. And that's what the father in Mark 9 did. He, he brought his boy to Jesus. And yet I wonder what you think about his prayer. If you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Now, admittedly, there are some positives here. He is bringing his boy to Jesus. He is speaking about the compassion of this loving Savior. He does do something I think he had never done before and ask Jesus to help in this situation, which is the most important thing we can do whenever someone needs healing. But there was a, a problem with that conditional term at the beginning of the man's petition. And Jesus thought that little word, if, betrayed a disturbing lack of confidence in his power to heal. If you can, Jesus exclaims, and I would love to know how Jesus said this, his body language, his tone of voice. Maybe he was indignant. Or did he say it the way I imagine it, with a slightly raised eyebrow? and a little twinkle in his eye, if you can, Jesus queried. This worried father had come face to face with the creator of the universe who had scattered the stars across the evening sky, who had first breathed life into our spongy lungs. He was in the presence of the miracle worker who had made the lame to walk and the blind to see. He was speaking with God the Son Almighty who in his divine being possesses a fullness of, on, um, of omnipotence. And he had the temerity to say to this great Savior, if you can, I suppose Jesus had the right to be offended by this man's uncertainty and unbelief, but I believe he responds with a kind of good humor. There are no ifs when it comes to the healing power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you believe this? He is able to perform healing miracles, and it is frankly amusing when anyone thinks otherwise. And this brings us to maybe the most relatable moment in Mark's account. Jesus says to the man, all things are possible for one who believes. And the father almost believed it. In fact, the first words out of his mouth form a confession of his faith. It's the simplest confession of faith that anyone could ever give. I believe. 
But without pausing for a breath, apparently he couldn't quite believe it because he also cried out, dear God, help my unbelief. Like many of the best people we meet in the Bible and like most of us, maybe all of us, this man is what I'm starting to think of as a doubter believer. Yes, it's a good thing to be a believer, but most of us are kind of doubter believers sometimes. He did believe enough to bring his child for healing, enough to see the Savior's compassion, enough to pray for more faith. But he also found it, frankly, hard to believe, which is why he, he said, just honestly, to where he was spiritually, if you can, and why he asked Jesus to help what he called his unbelief. Here's a man who believes enough to ask for a miracle and at the same time doubts enough to know that he needs help with his unbelief. Now, there is such a thing as active denial of the central truths of the Christian faith doubt in that sense, an unbeliever in that sense, someone who refuses to believe in the truth of the Bible or the deity of Jesus Christ or the salvation he offers through his atoning death and bodily resurrection. Such unbelief is sin, which is one of the reasons we need to wrestle with our doubts and not simply give in to them. The Bible is clear. Unbelievers in that sense will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's Revelation 21. The writer to the Hebrews gives us this life-saving warning. I wonder, is this a warning you need to hear this morning? Take care, brothers and sisters, lest there be in any of you an evil unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. There is that kind of unbelief. The Bible speaks to it and warns us against it. But that's not the kind of unbelief the father in Mark 9 was talking about. Here is a man who believes and struggles to believe. And if that seems like a kind of contradiction, just recognize faith and doubt often go together. That's one of the main things I wanna emphasize in this entire series. I like the way Christian Wyman talks about this paradox in one of his short essays. Maybe you can relate to this as well. Maybe you found this to be true in your own life. He says, I always have this sense that something is going to resolve my spiritual anxieties once and for all, that one day I'll just relax and be a believer. So I read book after book. I seek out conversations with people I respect who seem to rest more securely, securely in their faith than I do. But always the anxiety comes back. It's the norm from which my faith deviates. If faith is even what you could call these intense and yet fleeting experiences of God. That's how Wyman describes his spiritual struggle. And I wonder if an analogy will help clarify that struggle. Faith and doubt are not like a light switch that is either on or off, but more like a dimmer switch. And sometimes faith burns bright, but there are also times when it, it seems to grow dim. And what we see in Mark 9 verse 24, I think, is familiar to all of us. It is the flickering of faith and doubt. Where do you stand? this morning. And what do you think it would take for the Holy Spirit to brighten your belief? Here's a man fiddling with the spiritual dimmer switch in his soul and doing, I think, the best possible thing that anyone can do in that circumstance. He asks Jesus for more faith. And understand the Bible never describes faith as something we work up within ourselves. It always defines faith as a gift from God. Think of the Apostle Paul so famously, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. And that's true, by the way, of all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 
including those special visitations of the Spirit in seasons of revival, either personally or communally. It's a work of God the Holy Spirit. And if that is true, if it is true of faith specifically, that it is a divine gift, then the best thing to do when we doubt is to ask Jesus, help us believe. And we have a Savior who has all the sympathy in the world for people with honest doubts and at the same time, a genuine desire to believe and ask him for help to believe. I think as we look at Jesus in Mark chapter nine, he is the, the living proof of Jude 22, which exhorts us to have mercy on those who doubt. Jesus has that mercy, he shows it here. And the, the man here does the best thing he can do, which is to pray for the gift of faith but I want to acknowledge sometimes prayer is exactly the problem because one of our biggest doubts is whether God really does hear us and answer us. And maybe we feel like we've prayed for healing for ourselves or for someone else and God hasn't healed and it makes it hard to come and pray again in a really sincere, believing way. In a recent study of American spirituality, Pew Research discovered that people who are skeptical about faith often have no experiential relationship to prayer. Isn't that interesting? People that say that I'm struggling with faith in God and I'm not praying. Even Christians, Pew goes on to say, when they talk about the power of prayer, have no real connection to anyone or anything on the other end. They, they believe that their words, no matter how earnest, remain unheard, end quote. The truth is that God does hear our prayers. He always does. But sometimes we have to wait. God is patient. He may not answer our prayers right away, and he may not answer them the way we would answer them. In fact, usually he doesn't because he has so much bigger purposes than we would. But if there is one petition God loves to answer, it is a genuine request for the help we need to believe. And so when we struggle with doubt, I, I, I say when, not if, pray, we should pray specifically for the gift of faith. And what a wonderful prayer to, to pray that we have right here in Mark chapter nine, when this man says, I do believe, and then here's the prayer, help my unbelief, help my unbelief, Jesus. I wonder if you have wondered, maybe during this series on doubt, what happens to people who struggle with their doubts? And I wanna give you some good news about that. The most likely outcome for you is that your faith will grow stronger. And this is what the research shows. I'm referring again to this Pew data Two-thirds of American adults who identify as Christians say they have gone through periods when they questioned what they believe about God. I was actually surprised it wasn't higher than that, but it's at least two-thirds. Sadly, some of them did end up walking away from God. About one in nine. That's why it's so important for us to fight for our faith and to hang in there with people that are struggling with doubt. But this is also true that eventually the vast majority of Christians who find it hard to believe come back stronger than ever. Almost all of them do. Praise God for that. And I think that's what must have happened to this man in Mark chapter 9. He has this flicker of doubt, this moment of believing, and then he saw Jesus answer his prayers. So, so dramatically. If you notice, and we're listening carefully, the crowd, as big as it was at the beginning, was growing. People could see something was happening. People were running up to see. Jesus rebukes the unclean spirit, commands the spirit to come out of the child and never enter him again. It's a clean sweep. And at first people thought, you know, that just actually made things worse because there the boy is and he seems to be dead. He's lying there like a corpse once the demon comes out. I wonder if this is in the plan of God, a kind of adumbration of the resurrection. I mean, a foreshadowing because Jesus takes the boy by the hand. The Bible says he lifted him up and he, did you notice the verb here? He arose. 
When this boy gave his testimony ever after this, he was able to say, let me tell you what happened, up from the ground I arose. And the father was able to testify that even when he doubted, God was faithful, that he did the right thing when he brought his son to Jesus, that his faith, yes, a little doubtful, was well-placed. The son was healed. And I find this true story from the gospel giving us doubt, conquering hope for our own eventual healing. Here's the message. Jesus Christ has authority over the demons that torment our souls and over the, the dark emotions that threaten at times to overwhelm us, over the disabilities and diseases that debilitate us, over wounds so deep that we are afraid to discover them. At the end of this story, Jesus said something to his disciples that applies to so many of our own painful struggles. This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer which is really a way of saying that only Jesus can do it. When we pray, Jesus heals. Not right away, necessarily, or not even necessarily during this lifetime. The, the healing in this passage isn't some kind of promise of immediate deliverance. It is a sign of the coming kingdom of God when the Bible promises every sorrow will be consoled, every pain removed, every tear wiped away. And I have come to accept. And it was hard for me to accept that I will need to wait for my healing. There's a vivid picture of this in the Lord of the Rings passage I understand a lot better later in life than I used to. You know the story probably, his heroic journey to Mount Doom, Frodo Baggins rescues Middle Earth, and then he is carried by eagles to the houses of healing, and he is nursed back to health, and yet he still bears physical scars from being stabbed and bitten. His soul is tormented by unspeakable evils that he has suffered. And he bears a weariness that nothing in this world will unburden. He needs a deeper healing than that. And so in the end, and weren't you a little sad when it happened? He has to leave Middle Earth and he sails across the sea to the undying lands. You have a similar journey to take, as do I. I suppose it will be sad to leave this world behind, but when we wake up and see Jesus, we will be healed, yes. healed. Yes. Life after death means comfort after sorrow, healing after pain. Can you even imagine it? Maybe Ella could tell you what it was like. I mentioned her sad medical situation at the beginning of this message. And I mentioned that I have permission from the Quisera family to tell her story. They, they said, this is God's story, tell it. She needed open heart surgery. She was blocked by the government from getting it. You wanna know what happened? Her father received a Billy Graham scholarship to attend the Wheaton College Graduate School. And when he matriculated, the family had permission to travel to the US. And when they arrived, they discovered they were eligible for Medicaid. So a few months ago, Ella was wheeled into the surgical suite at one of the best hospitals in Chicago, all expenses paid. Can you imagine the almost miraculous moment at her hospital bed when she opened her eyes and realized, I'm still alive. And she saw her parents and learned from them that her heart was healed. Through the gift of sometimes doubtful yet genuine faith in Jesus Christ, one day you will open your eyes to the light of God's eternal day. And you will realize that you are alive again. And you will discover that you are healed. Body, soul, spirit. God give you the faith to believe that. And let's praise God for his power, his healing power. We're gonna sing oh for a thousand tongues to sing. Dr. Clemmy will come forward. Let's stand and get ready to sing with the orchestra.